So thank, thank you very much for the uh, warm introduction and also for inviting me to uh, address this, this issue. So really, thank you very much. Uh, I actually, in some ways, following uh, Ruti's, uh, Ruti Gavison's exercise, uh, we are dealing with the following question. We're dealing with the tension between democracy and liberalism, or between majoritarianism and liberalism. And, um, and I think there is a problem in the formulation of the question. And my attempt will be to outline a, a conceptual frame for what democracy is, and then maybe we can relate or rephrase the question. Um, but before I'm doing that, I want to for a minute zero in on the nature of the crisis. So I, what is exactly the crisis we're talking about? Clearly, not every time we lose an election, we, I mean, if your opinion loses an election, it's a crisis in democracy, you know? It's just you lost an election. Uh, uh, so we want to we wanna focus where the problem is. And I, I don't want to use the term populism, which I find slightly vague, I mean, I, it has interpretations, it has good interpretations, but I, I want to focus on a different issue here. Uh, uh, um, again, um, my assumption is that if we share this sense of crisis, then we can conceptually deal with it. I want to talk about the emergence of ultranationalism. By ultranationalism, I mean there isn't any crisis in their being ethnic nationalism in different places in Europe, everywhere, right? So, uh, I don't know, when, when, when Norway seceded from Sweden in 1917 because the Norwegians thought that they are culturally, ethnically distinct group, it's still not a crisis in democracy or whatever. Or when the Baltic states uh, seceding from the, oh, after the breakdown of the Soviet Union in 91, opted not to have a multinational state, the Baltic national state, multinational state in, I don't know, Switzerland style, or didn't opt for a, a, a kind of a neutral liberal state in the US style, but opted for a three distinct national states of Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia, it's still not a crisis in democracy per se. So I, I want to zero in on where the crisis is. I mean, again, there are different ways of framing it. It's not nationalism as such. It's a moment in which a national movement becomes an ultra-national movement. It, it has two features to it. The first, and that's the main thing, is when in the name of majority nationalism, rights and status of minorities within the state, and no state is homogeneous, are undermined economically, politically, and culturally. That's the ultimate test for any nation state. Right. And, that's, um, uh, and that's a future. By the way, what will come with it usually in the, in the spectrum of the shift to ultranationalism is, uh, is, uh, is weakening and attacking those institutions in society that are there to protect minorities, the courts, NGOs, media, and other things. That's, that's a, a main disturbing feature that we see around. Or, for example, this following Zev, uh, uh, legislating a nation state law without committing yourself to equality. Whatever your conception of the nation state is, whether you want a flag that reflects your culture, uh, uh, um, um, whether you want uh, a calendar that reflects your culture, a language, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you ought to commit yourself to one very basic principle, which is whatever the character of the state and its identity means, it will never be such that it will undermine the status and position of minorities. Uh, uh, so that's one uh, um, a major concern of of the shift. Again, the shift is spectral, and there is a spectrum here and different uh, uh, levels of spectrum. The other thing, which I'm not going to deal with that much, but I think it's a feature of ultranationalism, which is all states are partial to their citizens. Clearly, 
they distribute welfare goods among their citizens, but one feature of ultranationalism is complete disregard to human large concerns at war and other things. I, there were a, a feature, I, I would say, an interesting feature of our age that uh, when, um, when you emerge with this kind of competitive nationalism, Trump style, uh, what you cannot deal is with, for example, with environmental problems because they need cooperation. It's a problem of humanity. And one feature of ultranationalism uh, and its disregard for constraints, humanitarian constraints on his own interests, is really incapacity for a joint shared uh, action vis-a-vis -vis human problem as such. But I, I want to focus, as I said, I want to focus on what I consider is, uh, is the, the main issue at stake. It's not nationalism per se, it's not the emergence of nationalism, it's a, it's, it's the, it's a, it's a kind of slide to ultranationalism, which is, which is about this, this aspect. Uh, again, in different features of it. The, I mean the aspects of the equality, dignity, rights of minorities. Now, by the way, it's all done clearly in the name of democracy, after all, because democracy is the majority, and we, the majority shouldn't be constrained. And arguing, again, arguing, and this is an argument that you hear in all ultranationalist language, which is that the courts or other institutions that are there to protect minorities really undermine the spirit of the majority and undermine democracy. By that insistence, it becomes an elite practice of staying in power while we lost it in elections. So that's the, that's the sort of, I would say, gross framework. By the way, the rise of ultranationalism in different areas have different reasons for it, are not the same reasons. Uh, I mean, in Israel, for example, in Europe, it has to do with immigration, it has to do with globalization, clearly large inequality, etc. In Israel, Israel, the emergence of ultranationalism in Israel has nothing to do with immigration. We don't, we don't have an immigration issue. It doesn't have to do with globalization. Israel has is gained a lot from globalization. I don't think any ultranationalistic a uh, country, uh, uh, government here will fight globalization, etc. Yeah, so there, there are a variety of reasons in different places, but this is a shared feature. So uh, what I would like to do is the following, and I think I'm troubled by the framing of the issue because this is the way the ultranationalists frame the issue. There's, there's a majoritarian idea of democracy in clash with, with all these liberal ideas, and the liberals are using non-democratic institutions to protect their claims, etc., against majorities, etc., etc. So I want to, I, 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 uh, I want to give it's it's a kind of a historical picture, but it's a conceptual normative analysis of what democracy is, or what's appealing about democracy, and see whether this uh, uh, this dichotomy even makes sense, and whether we should. We should even formulate the problem this way. So I, I would like to talk about what I think are the three appealing features of democracy, or that they carry the moral force of democracy. The first thing, and this is something that people somehow omit, but I think it's the basis of democracy, is one person, one vote. Okay? When we talk about universal suffrage. One person, one vote, meaning democracy assumes equality, right? which is the following. And that has to be something very important for us to remember, which is the following. It says, um, if you are governed by a state which defines your fate through its decisions, and it defines your fate in many ways, you ought to have equal weight as a subject of their state, equal weight in defining that future. It assumes autonomy, it assumes equality. You ought to have, like everyone else, an equal weight in the process. By the way, clearly, for Israel, the crisis of democracy is having under our control 2.8 million people who don't have that weight in defining their future. I know it's complicated to uh, uh, to resolve it, it's not easy, it takes a price, but it's a 
it's a real democracy deficit. But the idea, underlying, again, underlying the idea of democracy is a deep concept of equality, which is every person who is a subject to a state has to have the power equally to everyone else to define the political future of that entity. By the way, it assumes, again, it assumes dignity. It assumes that you have the rights, you have the powers to be part of that process. By the way, look how strange it will be, and this is why um, a pure majoritarianism will undermine that very basic concept of democracy, how strange it will be for a country to accept this concept as a running concept, and yet when it distributes goods, let's say welfare goods, etc., etc., it will distribute them unequally. So it will say, well, we think everybody is, has the dignity and the autonomy to share in the process of governing and has the right to assume a, a, a responsibility for his or her political fate, but when we, you know, we treat them unequally as a majority, that sounds so bizarre if you internalize that idea of democracy. So that's the first issue. Uh, and here I think a lot of the, uh, the, the, the first principle of democracy is not majoritarian in that respect. It's actually uh, egalitarian and, uh, and assuming the dignity of its subjects. The second issue, I'm, I'm, I, I'm sort of being part of the debate in, in, in our country and in other countries, I've, I feel that there is, maybe I'm saying something's completely trivial, but I feel that there is in the conversation a lack of clarity of what is exactly appealing about democracy altogether. Right. So, well, one thing that is deeply appealing about democracy is this idea. It has a deep egalitarian and, and, uh, uh, concept underlying it, and it, ha it reflects a respect to the dignity of its subject. Now, the second idea, which is its rule by argument, right? You, you got the power to rule us, because you have convinced the majority of us that you have the right ideas, right? You have the right ideas, and you can implement well. It's a rule, you didn't seize the power by force, by inheritance, by any other means, but by convincing us. It's a rule by argument. It's a fascinating idea, right? You argue well, you present your arguments before us, and if you convinced enough of us, you have the power for the time being to decide to implement your policy. I want to say one thing. What does it mean, a rule by argument? And now there is a vulnerability. It's a vulnerability of this age, but not only a vulnerability of this age, but prior democracies, which is how to protect this idea of democracy. Clearly, it needs freedom of speech. It needs listening to the others. It needs that while you are in power, others can express their opinions so argument will go on. It needs, by the way, and that's an, a, a huge educational challenge for all of us, it's need how to make, if you talk about democratic education, you ask yourself the following. How to make your students being open to arguments and immune to manipulation. That's uh, the, the, the weakness of ruling by speech is, is, uh, is that very thin, complex line uh, of and a crisis in democracy is when the cultural argument is no more there because uh, campaigns are run by, by, uh, by uh, publicity companies, by, by selling products, et cetera, et cetera, and also by undermining the very idea of a fact. No, no facts. Now, it's not clear what the argument is about, 
And so there are many ways, I mean, we can talk a lot about that, but there is many ways in which that principle of democracy is undermined. Again, I'm saying it's, it is so strange. If, if this is an attractive element of democracy, I think it's very deeply attractive, morally attractive element of it. It's so weird to think about illiberal democracy. What could that mean? I mean, we, we're talking about the following, right? We're talking about, you've got to convince us, etc. That means uh, if you want a real argument, if you, want, if you think it's not manipulation, it's not, it's not brainwashing, etc., etc., it's an argument. You have presented us with an argument here, etc. The, the, the infrastructure, the human infrastructure for that appealing idea to work means more or less, I mean, okay, institutionalizing it in different ways, means deeply inheriting the liberal, the liberal notion of what uh, um, society should look like. So that's, that's the second feature. By the way, that means the following in relation to the first principle. That means that majorities who undermine that principle need to be constrained in the name of what's appealing about democracy, need to be constrained through constitutional other bodies that will be there to protect that value of what democracy is about. The third, the third thing, I mean, this is a, the third issue, I think, I'm trying to conceptually outline what's so powerful about democracy and its relationship to liberalism, not as an opposing, constraining idea, but something integral to what we understand democracy to be. Uh, the second, the, the third feature is it's a non-violent procedure to adjudicate differences. Right. We, it's, it's our capacity to live in differences. We have a non-violent procedure. By the way, when I look at, at Israel, and I, I always worry, I, part, of, part of the ways in which democracies manage to... Uh, to guarantee this nonviolent procedure is re lowering the stakes of the argument, right? So, well, the stakes are so high, if political temperature is so high. Uh, then, on the one hand, you get a lot of participation. This is the Israeli case, because stakes are high, and people are mobilized to participate. On the other hand, you're not sure whether you'll be able to maintain the nonviolent nature of that procedure. Right? I look at my own family, right? So uh, in our family, there is huge political differences. I'm not going to enumerate who's what, etc., etc., <laughs> keeping the privacy of the people. But you can imagine, you, know, you can ma imagine the temperature, right? So sort of, uh, you know, once we had in the Seder a political debate, and I said to, my, to the other members of my family, that was Pharaoh's revenge, no question about that. <laughs> Say that was Pharaoh's revenge. <laughs> I mean, uh, now, uh, so, so, um, um, so you have, um, you, you have a nonviolent procedure to adjudicate differences, right, where it's not the winner takes all, because if the other party ends in jail or, or or, or in exile, or, 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 or whatever, after an election. Uh, uh, that means that there won't be any, any capacity to adjudicate these differences in a procedure. That moment where, that, that great moment in democracy where the loser makes a phone call to the other party. So as well, even, even the incumbent, that's more interesting. The non-incumbent, it's not that interesting. But the incumbent says, well, I'm, I'm leaving my premises. Uh, premises is a big issue here, by the way. <laughs> Don't underestimate that. So, uh, so you say, uh, you, you say the, 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 the issue of the, the so cherished in democracy. Um, now, here again, can you maintain that feature of democracy 
when you define your minority or other aspects as enemies of the state, right? Which is part of the language of ultranationalism, right? When you designate um, a section, I would say ultranationalism, the language of it is the enemy from within. You know, when, when hawkish Israeli parties move from hawkish liberal parties to ultranationalists, there will be always one uh, signal for me that the enemy now will be within, not the other countries around, etc. It's, it's those minorities that are the enemies, uh, uh, etc. Now, can you, can you maintain that feature of democracy in, in a serious way uh, without uh, uh, while, while defining your opponent as an enemy. Could there be a, a democracy, a genuine democracy, with that sensibility, with that public culture? So what I, what I, was, what I was trying to do is to, uh, the following uh, exercise, which is um, let's do a conceptual analysis of what's normatively appealing in democracy, right? Prior to asking, uh, prior to assuming the majoritarian concept of democracy as its main pillar, and then locating liberalism as a, as a kind of an enemy, or not an enemy, a rival, a constraining rival, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but asking the following question, uh, which will be, to what degree the very concept of democracy, speaking in its full robust sense of what's valuable in it, in what I assume it's three ideas. First, an as assumption of both egalitarian concept and autonomy concept of subjects. The second is rule by argument. And the third is a nonviolent procedure to adjudicate differences. Uh, uh, if, you, if you assume that these are what I would call the normatively attractive features of democracy as we know it, right? Then you ask yourself, then it's not clear uh, that the tension, is, uh, uh, the tension exists or it's fully articulated in a, in a serious way, in the way it, it has been articulated, which I find, I find actually very regretting in, in the way it is articulated. Yes. Um, here's the, it's kind of the ultra-nationalist swing talking in the name of majoritarian democracy and then you have those elites, it's always the elites who try to control the process because they lost power in the, in the election, etc., etc. So uh, that's my, my, my modest contribution to, uh, um, uh, to the question, right? Uh, again, if I look, um, as I said, if we define the crisis in this term, this is the emergence of ultranationalism, and then you're going to ask yourself, okay, how do, how do I measure that? Is there a, a point in which you say well, it's spectral? It ought to be, I think, it ought to be um, registered registered in, in, this, in, in the area of these three foundational normative appealing concepts of democracy. So you would say, for example, if someone, if, if there is an attempt of voter repression, right? Voter repression is one of the ways in which uh, ultranationalists, either because of race or religion or ethnic or other things, uh, uh, really undermine the, the very basic idea of what democracy is, though they might be the majority, right? But it's no more democracy in that in the sense of equal respect to each of us to have a, an equal weight. Uh, and then you see uh, in different countries attempts. By the way, usually they backfire. As I mean, that's the other side should know it. But voter repression actually is a reason for voter at least in many ways, of voter appearance. But that's, again, a sign, right, a sign. And it, it's done subtly, it's done in different ways, it's, it's done 
uh, it's done by, by, by mobilizing your own group, by claiming the other group is coming. So, um, um, different cameras in different places, other things, etc. We know the subtle ways of voter repression, but voter repression is one of the main signs of the breakdown of democracy by the majoritarian uh, supremacist conception. Uh, so, uh, so what I try to do again is is really um, a, an attempt to uh, um, to reframe the question in ways that. Um, would, would, would articulate the problem in completely different terms. It's really not. I imagine we share that concern. Our concern is, is really not about the clash between democracy and liberalism. That's not the issues we're facing. It's really about undermining the very normative foundations of democracy as we understand it. So thank you very much.